Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to uh, get the session started in the interest of everybody being able to make the cocktail hour on time, because we're the only thing that stands between uh, you and it. So if somebody could uh, close the doors over there and take your chit chat outside or. Okay. I'm Dr. Uh, Scott Helton, and it's my uh, dubious distinction uh, to uh, be the chair of this new uh, uh, senior council. And I want to take just a few minutes uh, and talk about uh, how this came to be. Um, Mike D'Angelica, when he was the president of the association, came up with the idea. He felt that uh, the association would benefit from keeping its senior members more engaged and uh, proposed to the executive council uh, the creation of this uh, senior council. Uh, and they voted upon it and approved it. And the uh, chairperson, I'm the first chairperson and the co-chair is Yu Man Fong, uh, will have representation on the board. The, the purpose of this is stated is to be the keep senior members engaged in the association and tap into their collective experience and knowledge. Uh, secondly, to provide some input to the executive council when needed or to have a voice, at least at the seat of the executive council on matters as it relates uh, to increasing the value of the HPBA to senior members. And finally, and then most importantly, to engage with the Young Surgeons Committee and to provide a resource for mentoring. Um, so we had, uh, we sent out this mass email to the entire uh, membership asking for people that would be interested. Their criteria to uh, be invited was you had to be over 65 and you had to be an active longstanding uh, member. We had about 25 people respond. And in August, for the first time, we had a Zoom meeting where we all got together and collectively just came up with ideas. We booted around a lot of different concepts and, and things we thought would be of value, particularly to the young uh, people starting out uh, their career. And we took about 20 ideas and we distilled it down uh, to about five, but we only have time really uh, to discuss about three. And the three topics that we picked, which you'll see in the agenda, we thought would be uh, very interesting uh, to the group as a whole. And the, the topics that we're going to talk about are things that are rarely, if ever, talked about at medical meetings and certainly not at surgical meetings. And so we think that this uh, will be an interesting uh, beginning uh, to address other topics, which we also think are going to be valuable. The plan is to put on webinars, uh, Zoom webinars, like we have in the last couple of years uh, that the entire association can uh, part participate in. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Yu Man Fong to introduce our, our first speaker. Well, welcome everyone uh, to our session. And I'm, I'm a little disappointed that the youngsters, the uh, uh, folks that were in fellowship all left because I think some of these topics will be really important for them to think about as they start their careers. And, and that's because you can't you can make it up later, okay? The nice thing about this panel is that uh, I don't think anyone really needs an introduction, uh, yeah, but uh, the first speaker is gonna be Susan Orloff, the uh, Chief of Transplant uh, from Oregon Health Sciences. And she's gonna talk to us about all things must come to an end. When is it time to retire, okay? And uh, I didn't realize that 65 was a criteria. Can I leave now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to put a, a little clarification there. <laughs> to be a member of the committee, yes, uh, you're an exception, you mon. And uh, just because I'm over 65 doesn't mean that the other panelists are. And in fair disclosure, I'm not going to. I'm not going to tell you what their ages are. Well, well, I'll disclose that I'm 65 next month. So <laughs> you're both fired. <laughs> 
you can, you can so look at the podium. I, I'm trying to figure out, I can't see that far, but my glasses okay. don't see that far. They're nearsighted. So how do I see my slides? Because I can't, I didn't memorize all of my slides. Is, is this better? Oh, no. <laughs> so um, what I was thinking I could do. That is a proclamation of aging. Well, so so can I just can't take, even read the slides down there? Take a, a uh, microphone and go down there. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Grab that. Did you forget your glasses? Oh, okay. Just wondering if somebody can do my slide thing. Here. What's that? Oh, here I go. Green is for Thank you so much, um, Scott Newman, for can you? Can you this way? Is that okay? Can everybody hear me? Hello? Oh, good. Okay. Can I go this far to the right? Because then I can look at this one. Stop right there. Well, thank you again for the invitation. This is really exciting to have this session. And I'm sorry again that there aren't more people because it's an important session for those of you in your maybe not 30s, but 40s and 50s to think about. So I'm going to get started. And uh, this is another way of saying all things must pass. You probably remember those of us who are old, George Harrison's album there. And an alternate title for me is I Ain't Gonna Work on Maggie's Farm No More. Bob Dylan wrote this in 1965. And these are the two albums. And I had the first one uh, with the red dressed woman. So I had that in the 60s in my collection. So my disclosure is I have not yet retired, but I have 10 months to go. Hence, I gathered wisdom and insights from some HPV, transplant vascular and general surgeons who have retired. So I'm really excited to impart this wisdom to you. And I wanted to give a shout out to the Ukrainians. And I think Ben Franklin says it well, there never was a good war or a bad peace. So I queried uh, those who have retired and asked what was or were your greatest fears about retiring? In retirement, what are your three greatest joys? Three things that you're most gratified by? How do you maintain connectivity and sense of purpose? How do you maintain intellectual stimulation? What three pearls of advice would you give to colleagues on the path? to retirement and provide any free text or associations for those thinking about the process. And so first one, a person that's near and dear to all of us, Paul Gregg, and you can see uh, the photo on the left is him in his band Spire. And on the right, he's hiking uh, the um, mountains and a glacier north of Lake Louise. And he says, I thoroughly love my new life almost never reflect on my previous one. Surgery seems like a lifetime ago. I'm occasionally asked questions about it. I do find medicine related news interesting, but it rapidly became what I used to do and I don't miss it at all. So his three life components are domestic. He contributes to the household music. He has musical genes and he he actually has two bands and we can look them up. He gave the YouTube and the links, but Knights of the Mystic Eye and he's released a CD as well as Spire. And he's actually started gigging and he takes guitar lessons weekly and jams with other guys. So I play my guitar a lot hiking. He said, having paid no regard to my physical fitness for over 40 years, except for three days of skiing each winter, I climbed greater than 300 meter peaks in the Rockies last year. Next month, he's meeting others in Kathmandu for a month of trekking in the Himalayas, including the base camp at Everest. Greatest fears, financial security first. Having not to worry about money is really important, but once you have more money than time, simple math, more is just greedy, notwithstanding the children's inheritance, and there is life outside the hospital. Second, what will I do all day? Well, many retired individuals said you'd be surprised how quickly your day gets filled up, meaning they didn't do anything meaningful. And some have started a new hobby. He tried woodworking, but he figured that was too late to get any good at it. And I don't like dabbling. What I hadn't prepared for was a change is required for daily interaction at home with his wife and 
adjustments we both had to make, difficult to anticipate. I jokingly used to say for better, for worse, but not for lunch. And there's some truth to that. Three greatest joys about one month after retiring on his seventh birthday, I no longer felt exhausted. For decades, I denied burnout was wrong, especially in my last five years. A sense of happiness from that relief. I'm learning how to have fun. Our profession is really serious. It's easy to become judgmental of others who aren't. Now I'm better able to appreciate my new friends for who they are today, not for what they did or did not do for the past 50 years as they teach me how to have fun and uh, through their outlooks on life. I became tired of being important. I think this is a really important concept. So many others constantly dependent upon me, patients, fellows, et cetera. I'm blissfully content doing what I want to do now, albeit totally narcissistic, um, with the obligations limiting to those who really matter to me, family, band members, and friends. Three things you're most gratified by. I confess a sense of accomplishment when I reflect on my surgical career. Time, I'm reading more. Currently, stoic philosophy of YouTube videos on evolution of hominids, creation of the universe. Those of you who know Paul Gregg, he's such an intellectual and he in quantum physics. I, I will struggle with all the waves. Funny that there are so many days when there hasn't been enough time to do what I'd plan. Personal growth, yes, there's always something new in surgery and transplantation. However, one continue, when one continues to get better, but that slows down a lot in one's later career, but perhaps by decree of complacency associated with having mastered the craft. Now I find myself much more challenged by understanding, applying music, theory, guitar performance, recording, editing, and mixing new music. Physical challenges in the gym and on the trail. So these are things that he really appreciates now more than ever. Maintaining connectivity and sense of purpose. Connectivity, well, I don't have much with former colleagues, which I think is interesting. I do not want to become the emeritus guy who kept showing up at the hospital, pretending or wanting to still be important. One of Bernie's, that's Bernie Langer, last pieces of advice to me was once you stop operating, you should stop giving advice. And I have seen others previously, other previously prominent surgeons embarrass themselves well past their best by date. One rapidly becomes how they used to do it. And we all know those people that show up at conferences, grand rounds, other things and say, this is the way I used to do it. And the young folks say, you know, what are you doing here? <laughs> so I think that's important to take in. Sense of purpose is very important. Can be a bucket list, record an album, perform live music, climb the Rocky Mountains, put your foot on Mount Everest. Other gratifying opportunities include involvement in philanthropic philanthropic endeavors, grandparent a child, community activism, maybe write a book of one's memoirs, but I'm trying to live in the present, not to reminisce about the past. This goes back to the planning sage. What do I do all day? Maintaining intellectual stimulation. I take weekly music guitar lessons. What a comeuppance from being the master of surgery to becoming a student. And it's interesting regression and nervousness to be in that position, but essential to growth. And the commitment is important. Creativity, he states, in general, surgeons aren't that creative. An artistic endeavor provides the opportunity to be creative and can be the source of great pride and accomplishment. Wordle. Has anybody here? Raise your hand if you ever do Wordle. Okay. Yes, I do. It's pretty simple, but it's fun. You look, I look forward to it. Usually I wait till one in the morning and then I do the next day's Wordle because they don't allow you to do it in succession anymore. And um, so intellectual enhancement and um, also his quest for physical fitness. And um, there's a lot of high level educational opportunities online. And I like his quote, but absent a rigorous plan or goal, I think of them as entertainment while I I eat lunch. Oh, yes. I eat lunch now. I almost never did in my previous life. How many people here eat lunch? Good for you. Okay. Because I haven't started that habit, but one day. Three pearls. Begin planning at least five years in advance. Take care of finances and develop a real plan. And I think this is an important concept for everyone in the room to realize because most of us decide a year ahead of time or even less to retire. And there takes some planning, embrace it. You don't want to back into it or have it forced upon you. You have to own it. Try to prepare for adjustment to domestic life outside the professional world and adapt. Free text or free association, have a few medical and other professionals, friends, colleagues who are still working full time well beyond their best date. I feel sorry for them. Their explanations differ, but I can't help wondering, is that, is it that they really have nothing else to do? Can you go golfing every day? Their ego needs 
them to still feel important. They lack insight into their decline in thinking and technical skills and confidence. Their alimony payments or child's med school tuition to Harvard require them to still work. What a pity. And they just can't think outside their current box or they are afraid of change. A couple of other random thoughts from Paul Gregg, avoid the rabbit holes of internet. Don't become a deep conspiracy theory zealot. Start saying yes, you have time for new experiences and then try laughing more. In May, he'll be 74, and just after he returns from Mount Everest, retired for four years and planning my next alpine adventure between band rehearsals, recording dates, and performances. I take pride on my professional accomplishments as I pride in my ch as I take pride in my children, but there's much more to learn and do, and without the relentless demands of our profession, I will and will enjoy the journey with his wife, Anne. So I also wanted to tell you, when I asked various people uh, to give their thoughts. They all said to say hello to the AHPBA group and that they miss you, but not enough to come to the meeting. <laughs> um, Carlos Pellegrini. I think most of you know Carlos. He was chair of surgery at UW for many years, and he trained me actually at UCSF when he was a young faculty. Greatest fears. I love it. His is one slide. Uh, being bored, not having something to do, three greatest joys, autonomy, coaching, having something that I love doing and helping others, three things that you're gratified by, ability to have control of what I do, not being called at night and a coaching leader. How do you maintain connectivity and sense of purpose? By constantly studying human relationships, by coaching and actively participating in academic affairs, maintaining intellectual stim stimulation. I take courses that advance my new field which is coaching, and do so constantly. Three pearls, plan for activities that mean something to you that you want to do. A permanent vacation will get you bored pretty quickly. And then his pre -text, uh, free text, uh, free association is prepare financially and intellectually for retirement. Haile Bass, he was my mentor and like a second father to me. Uh, he was uh, chair of surgery at UCSF and then became dean and chancellor. And I think most of you know him, and he was an active member many years ago. Greatest fears, I may not be healthy enough to do the things I wanted to do, but had not the time. A second fear was boredom. Finally, fear of being irrelevant as you fade from the professional picture as your friends and peers die or develop mental incapacity. Greatest joys, can do anything you want on your own time. Another joy, you have time to spend with your family and close friends. Lastly, you have the opportunity to read, write, and devote to hobbies. Gratification, same as number two, but the one thing he would add was being recognized, receiving awards from institutions, associations for any contributions he has made. Maintaining connectivity, Helping to make your retirement, it's helpful to make your retirement gradual. And as an academic surgery surgeon retiring, you may have to give up seeing patients, but maintain teaching or scholarly activities such as research. Continue to attend department grand rounds, seminars, guest lectures. Most important to maintain a sense of purpose in retirement. You now have time to give back to your department, your school, to organizations such as the ACS and the ASA to the community and society if the opportunity arises. But you must look for these opportunities. And once people know you're retiring, you'll be inundated. So you need to be selective. Intellectual stimulation. It's important to be engaged with intellectual offerings that are around you. Take courses related or not related to surgery and find a new career pathway. Few, us, few of us are fortunate enough to be able to do this, but you can maintain subscriptions to surgical journals and other leading journals that keeps you keeps you up to date in overall medicine. Pearls, wise to plan for your retirement long before the time, cultivate habits, hobbies and ensure financial security. And then his free association is plan for retirement long before to ensure healthy, enjoyable, active retirement, free of boredom and financial insecurity. And then we fall into two categories, which all of you can figure out what you identify with. And it's those of us who plan to work Work until we must retire because we're old or poor health and those who want to retire when they're young and vigorous enough to do the things in their bucket list. If you're among the first group, you must be sure that you retire while still competent because otherwise you are not only a danger to your patients, but you'll be remembered as an incompetent surgeon, no matter how good a surgeon you may have been during your entire career. And those of us have people around us that we work with that are fit this. If you're among the second group, it is key to secure your financial future for life after retirement. And he says, old age is not what is made out to be. When the aches and pains set in, you realize the golden years is a misnomer. The best advice is to stay healthy and fit during your 40s and 50s. Retire when you can still enjoy many years. Paul Hansen, we all know Paul was very involved in um, the HPBA. And here he is at his farm on the left your left and on the right he's hiking 
uh, some mountain peak in uh, Argentina. And greatest fears, was I retiring too early? No, Paul retired at age 58. Did I make a mistake, mainly regarding self-fulfillment? Was there more I should have contributed to in medicine, the practice, the fellowship? Ultimately, the answer has been no. I have no regrets. I'm redirecting my efforts to contributing to society in new ways, farming, donation, volunteering, learning new ways to participate in the community. Financial security, I like this one because how much money is enough? What if the economic environment changed? We have good financial counselors, at least in his family. For me, time was more important than lifestyle. That's kind of what Paul Gregg mentioned too. I know I knew we could adjust to our lifestyle if needed. We don't know when we will run out of time. Three joys. My time is largely my own, sleeping, reading, exercise, working on projects. I educated myself regarding HPB over 30 years, often to the exclusion of other interests. But now my education has expanded. Farming, plant biology, equipment maintenance and repair, welding, woodwork. Seems like the sky's the limit. I have been able to adventure in many ways I couldn't for the last 35 years. Paul went to Antarctica recently. He also went to Buenos Aires and, and uh, hiked there in the Patagonia area. Three things most gratified, the development of growing and productive farm, and he sells to local restaurants, food banks, and gives them to friends, his, his uh, crops, being able to explore new areas of interest without the guilt associated with work. And then there are endless number of things to do, places to go, things to learn. I feel healthier, sleep, exercise, education, focus time with family, and less stress. Connectivity and purpose. He participates in his HPB intellectual and uh, educational conferences with his old team. He operates three to four times a month for tough cases. He assists, develop new connections in communities of farming, volunteering, traveling, and education. Maintaining intellectual stimulation. This is easy. You have to be actively curious. I like that one because that's another common theme. I don't have enough time during any day to read and learn everything I want to. Pearls, financial, there's no way to guarantee guarantee financial security. Things could change, and as, as mentioned before. And then purpose. I start my day 5 to 6 in the morning. I set goals, create to-do lists, work on projects and um, that, are, that he finds self-rewarding. Uh, and he takes care of his health, both mental and physical, as well as his relationships. I loved my job. It was the most fulfilling and rewarding career I could have imagined for myself, fellows, patients, partners, and surgery. I feel incredibly fortunate to have had career opportunities. I did not quit because I was unhappy. I quit because there were other things I needed to do before I ran out of time, health, and energy. Karen Devaney, she was a program director for over 30 years at OHSU, and her uh, husband was chief of general surgery, and they're dear friends and great people. Greatest fear is losing my relevancy and no longer being a productive member of society. Her parents were Depression-era people for whom a person who was not was most worthwhile if they were honest and worked hard. Joy, sleeping in, getting up when I want to, spending more time with Cliff, her husband, who's pictured there, and then hearing the world's greatest music and artists as often as we can. Gratification was came from both good health and remain fit, live in a place where the, the, everything is beautiful in Oregon. You all have to visit if you haven't been there. Have many friends with whom they can enjoy and share um, philosophy of life. Sense of purpose through contributions, nonprofit organizations. And, you know, they, they're on many boards, too, and they're maintaining old and making new friendships. Intellectual stimulation, addiction to reading books and variety, wide variety of subjects. Remain up to date on world events and avoid diving down the mind numbing rabbit hole of social media. That's been mentioned, too. Pearls remain physically, mentally active. Eat high quality food, avoid junk food and remain curious. Free text association. I would caution against being so afraid of being, being irrelevant that you get involved in too many worthy causes right from the beginning. I did that, and now I have less time to just chill out than when I was working. Also, avoid getting bogged down by all the negativity that is out there. I think this is important, too. Yes, the world's a mess. We all know it, and we are likely not to be able to make a huge difference in that, but we can appreciate every day the good fortune we have and try to help improve whatever problems are within our grasp. Her husband, Cliff, as I mentioned, chief of general surgery for many years at, at OHSU and at the Portland VA, there he is with his cat on his lap and he's drinking a glass of wine. For most people who have had a productive, intense uh, job, retirement is a big shift. It's not easy and it's no, you no longer feel important or relevant, but this is a new life and it you have to work at it. Maintain your friendships. This is a common theme too. 
these people are still your friends. They still hold you uh, the same place for you as when you weren't retired. Do not become detached or isolated with your friends. Find or develop interests in programs, entities, which you can play an active role in. They are participating in many areas in, in Portland, Feral Cat. Uh, coalition and music and uh, they also really want to relax and you have time to enjoy activities happiness in retirement does not come spontaneously or naturally for those who love their work it's it's tough but you can find happiness and satisfaction in retirement if you maintain your friendships in and out of medicine focus on being active and in, interacting with others and avoid being detached and stay connected now i don't think there's enough time to go uh, i think kai wrote me about a five page essay on this kai johansson was one of um, Scott Helton's mentors and was the first resident in, in my dad's program way back in the 60s. But I'm going to go through just, I'm happy to share these slides with you because I don't want to take up everybody else's time. And so I'm not going to go over that. But one book I want to introduce to you is called From Strength to Strength. And it's written by Arthur Brooks. And he was actually uh, head of a think tank the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., and then, and then became a professor of the Kennedy School at Harvard, as well as the Harvard Business School. And he wrote this book about the second curve in one's life. If productivity and creativity, fluid intelligence show a decline with age, the second curve represents crystallized intelligence using the inventory of knowledge and wisdom built up in earlier life. One needs to jump into this sex, second curve as one ages. Why people resist moving in to the second curve, and I'm sure there's many of you out there who do. Addiction to work, never-ending striving for success. You lose your self-identity because of the compulsion to succeed. How this can destroy relationships. Attachment to worldly possession and rewards prevents this shift. Pair down such possessions to the, only the essentials. Fear of decline keeps people on the striver's track, pushing themselves harder and harder to maintain their peak level despite impossible odds. Physical death is compared to professional death. One can and should be reborn after professional death. And then how to prepare for the leap to the second curve. Cultivate, maintain close personal relationships, difficult for overachievers and leaders. And there are many of those in this audience. Drop one's defensiveness about weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Be open about one's weaknesses. Show vulnerability. This leads unexpectedly to deep personal connections and even a new, more rewarding path. Transitions can be opportunities as much as crises. And then his seven-word mantra is use things, love people, worship the divine. And that divine is really whatever you want it to be. You don't have to be religious. There has to be something out there. Uh, maybe it's Buddhism, maybe it's, you know, the stars, but something that you can worship. And love is the key to happiness, but only love for people, not for things. And my words are, don't love something that doesn't love you back. So when you're ready, take the leap. This is my son, Jackson, jumping off 150 foot cliff into the Columbia River. And I like the quote, a flower does not think of competing with the flower next to it. It just blooms. So what I hope to have more time to do once I retire, you can see my family riding horses. That's me in uh, medical school in a three-day event. Surfing, that's one of my brothers. I don't surf that well. Dr. Hilton probably does. Um, and my family, and then I enjoy windsurfing in the Columbia River Gorge. And then my advice, possible plans and thoughts in it. They're in evolution. Embrace opportunities to give back however things motivate you to do so. Don't be a hanger honor. If that is what you think will provide you with value and self-worth, you can do better. Be curious and creative. Seek intellectual stimulation in many facets of life. Take time to enjoy family, friends, and other connectivity. Enjoy your newfound freedom. Do not regret being pro Programmed. This does not equate to value. Use your creativity to make the world a better place. Realize that the moon, the sun, and the stars are the limit. And my plans are, so far, I'm sure the list is going to get longer, gardening, guitar lessons, music on a broader sense, reading, horses. I used to teach and train horses and use this as a vehicle to help others with disabilities. Attend oceanography and marine biology classes. That was another passion of mine. And possibly teaching at a community college if I can uh, get the knowledge under my belt, serving individuals who are less fortunate. I've been in programs in Nicaragua for starting a transplant and HBB program with Sergio Lopez and Alvaro Castillo, one of our former fellows. And I'm Ain't going to work on Maggie's farm no more. So thank you very much. Let's embrace our future challenges, including retirement. And I don't know if there's time for questions, but the best way to predict the future is to create it by Abe Lincoln. <laughs> hey.
Thank you, Susan. Uh, I forgot to say at the beginning, uh, we came up with the name of this symposium uh, and a shout out to Reed Adams, former president of the association who coined the term. How about just wisdom from all, all these older people, wisdom from experience. Clearly, uh, thank you for tapping into the wisdom of all those great leaders. Um, I think that was very valuable. Well, in order to prepare for those retirements, one has to be financially prepared. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Talamonte, the chairman of North Shore uh, Hospital in Chicago, who's gonna talk about financial preparedness. Uh, thank you, Mike. Can you hear me? Well, I think you hit that little button. How about now, better? Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Helton, Dr. Fong, and Dr. Kent for the uh, opportunity to speak to you today. Um, it is very telling that at the end of the first the session that preceded this, all the young fellows ran out the door, right? Because they can't imagine ever having to retire. But fortunately, some of them came back in the room. And interestingly, I, as I look out of, over the audience, there are people in each segment, the three segments of our career, there's the new fellows that came back. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna teach you some things that uh, they didn't teach you in medical school. I guarantee you that. And there are people within their first 10 years of training and you know, you're know you you're just consumed. You're writing grants, you're doing your first big case, you're getting from assistant to associate professor like we heard before. And then there are those of us in the last 10 years of our career where you're thinking about how do I wanna retire? I wanna go out. I don't want to be Willie Mays playing for the Mets, tripping in the outfield. I want to be John Elway, who his last game, he threw three touchdowns and was the MVP in the Super Bowl, right? We have choices. We want to, we want to go out with grace and dignity. So um, why, there we go. Why is this important to you? Remember that, that most of us uh, are in our mid-30s by, by the time we finish our training. And, and our peak earning years are between 35 and maybe our early 60s. And that's a decade less than every other physician in medicine and every other self uh, well-educated professional in society. Who trains until they're in their mid-30s making you know $50,000 a year as a fellow? I don't even think I made that much when I was a fellow. Surgical uh, HPV surgeons, we all do it. And none of us are taught anything about this in medical school, residency, or fellowship, not a word. And, and that puts all of us at risk and it makes us vulnerable to retiring when we're not ready and not prepared. And then, and then you don't want your retirement to be that freight train coming at you uh, uh, in, in that tunnel with the headlights and you can't stop it. Um, so, so our ultimate goal, as I walk you through some of my, my slides today, isn't how to make a lot of money and retire with a, a, a Ferrari or a home in South of France. You chose the wrong profession if that's what you want, but it should be your goal is to retire gracefully and with dignity and what I call on your own terms. You don't want to be that person that stays too long. You don't want to be that person that's operating when, when he or she shouldn't be operating any longer. And you want to, you want your retirement to, as, as Susan so well pointed out, you want it to be a celebration of the next phase in your life. So let's talk about some of the basics that, that again, nobody teaches you in medical school or residency. And then we'll dive down in a, a little bit deep, deeper dive on some of these. You want to understand your assets. Basically, it's the money that you save and that the money that you have to have on hand to preserve your wealth. And it's the money that you want to invest called capital appreciation that you want to use to grow your wealth. And at different phases of your career, that's why it's actually kind of, uh, as you sit up here, I see everybody in different phases of their career. When you're young, it's about capital appreciation, right? You want to grow your wealth, but you better be putting some aside for that rainy day, that roof that collapses or that kid that has an accident and needs some extra medical care. Um, stuff happens, right? And as you get older, it may be too late for you to say, boy, I have to make you know $500,000 in the next 10 years of my career to get to my target. So, so there is a fluidity and a balance to understanding your assets and the timing in life and where you're at. And, and for the young folks, I want to talk about common retirement plans because all of us probably are employed by either a university or a healthcare plan. 
and you have what's called a 403B. In business, they call it a 401K, but for nonprofits, they call it a 403B. And if you think that single plan is going to get you to retirement, you are wrong. Um, and retirement planning doesn't have to be uh, um, uh, something that's nebulous or out there and you don't understand it. Um, you can set goals and you can calculate how much money you're going to need at what point in time you're going to retire. So if you're 65 and you think you're going to live another 15 years and you want to enjoy the lifestyle that we still have, they have calculators to help you figure out how much you're going to need based on inflation and future taxes. And we want to do that um, and, and make sure that as we're on this three-decade journey, every 10 years we can check in and make sure that we're, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Um, and, 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 and remember, as you plan your retirement, what do you want your retirement to look like? What are the things you want to enjoy in retirement? And I would suspect that most of us are just like, like, like the people that are up here now. We like our lives. We travel. We go to nice restaurants. We, we live in a nice, safe neighborhood. Our kids are educated with not a lot of debt. You, you don't really want to change that lifestyle too much, really, when you hit 65 or 70. You want to travel? Like I look, Looking at Dr. Pitt, one of my heroes. I mean, Henry, Henry's got a great life. He travels, he goes to academic meetings, he's enriched, he enjoys the profession. It's wonderful. And then if you know where the journey is going to end, then you could decide how you're going to get there, right? You can't go to Google Maps and say, I want to go to uh, uh, the, the restaurant down the street tonight and, and not know where you're going. Google Maps will get you there, but you have to know where you're going to get. So you have to know, kind of know what that money's going to have to look like when you're done, because that will help you design your investment strategies. And again, since there's a wide spectrum of doctors here, those investment strategies will absolutely change in time. If you've got 30% of your uh, retirement fund in, in stocks right now, I bet you're sweating a little bit with the market and inflation going up, right? You should be dialing some of that back. So let's talk about capital preservation and capital appreciation. I won't read you what's on the slide, but essentially it's not, it's, it's, wrong if all you're thinking about in your 30s and 40s is capital appreciation. You need to start saving some money for those rainy day things that happen. And ca capital preservation, cash, savings bonds, federal bonds, they're low risk, but they're low yield. But they're a good place to park your money because sooner or later, you're going to have to write checks for things that you didn't think you ever would have to write checks for. Capital appreciation is very much based on your age and stage and your financial underpinning. So that can include things like stocks, mutual funds. At one point in time, I actually owned a bunch of gold and silver. I don't know why I did it. My financial advisor did it. And then when the when the, the rare minerals market hit, I cashed all that in. I'm like, now I understood why he told me to buy gold. But 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 it's about risk stratification, right? When you're younger, you can take more risks. As you get older, you want to dial back the risks and preserve your cash. Retirement funds, as I told you, there are several different types. The employment-sponsored plans, the ones that we all have through our corporations or our universities, are called non-for-profit 403Bs. And it's money set aside for retirement, often with an employer match, and, and, and it's done before you pay taxes. You pay taxes on it later, but you pull it out monthly before, before uh, uh, you pay your taxes. Pay tax later, but it reduces your tax, the tax burden. Why is that important? I remember when I came out of MD Anderson, it was 1992. I was so excited. I wanted to set my practice. I wasn't paying attention to any of this stuff. Um, and then suddenly in my first year, my student loans came due. I was like, what? I got to pay these things back? Yeah. The Uncle Sam's really not going to pat you on the back and say, congratulations, you're a surgeon. Now you don't have to pay it anymore. You got to pay it back faster. Um, and, 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 and then your mortgage payments. I never owned a home while I was in training. My first home I bought was in 1992. And I had realtors telling me, you could afford three times what your base salary is. I'm like, I can't afford that kind of house. Trust me, you still can't afford that kind of house. Uh, buying your first house and seeing that first mortgage patient, mortgage uh, payment, it, it, it's stunning. And then there's this other little thing called Uncle Sam, the IRS, you have to start writing taxes, income taxes. You didn't pay very much taxes while you were in school, but now, you know, they see that six digit income. And as that six digit income grows, you're going to keep going up higher in, in tax brackets. So those tax deferred funds, those 403Bs are good because you put that money away before it's taxed. That lowers your taxable income. 
that affects the rate with which you save those you pay your savings bonds lower 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 taxable income slower rate to pay back your loans lower taxable income less money you have to pay for uncle sam now you can pay it later when you might be able to afford it more and then uh uh it, as i said before if you think one retirement fund is going to get you across the finish line i hate to tell you this but you're wrong you have to grow your wealth besides the employer matched little ir uh, employment funds those can be annuities they can be iras uh, i remember when i left no northwestern uh 16 years ago and i started at north shore i took my uh employer fund money uh, from northwestern and i rolled it right over into a traditional ira i still didn't have to pay taxes on it but now i had that money in a traditional ira i could play with it a little bit more i could be a little bit more aggressive because i had my new north shore 403b and i was i maxed out on that as much money as i could put in the government let me put in I put into it. Um, and then as your wealth increases and you have your employer uh, retirement account, you have your traditional uh, non-taxable uh, uh, or tax deferred account, you can open up things like Roth IRAs. Some people call them trusts. Some people call them uh, uh, Roth IRAs, but it's essentially money. After you pay all your bills at the end of the month, you can take that money and say, transfer $10,000 or $5,000 or whatever amount of money into that IRA so you can build your wealth and earn interest and modulate risk with those kind of retirement accounts. So if I go on my phone and I look up the little app that tells me how much my net worth is, first thing that comes up is my three uh, retirement funds, three of them. So where does this all get you? It gets you to retirement planning and investment strategies. Get help. Okay, I was sitting on the session before uh, uh, for the, the Bernard Langer session for the new, new young uh, uh, fellows finish. What to tell the fellows? You go into your first job and you're doing your first big case. What do we always tell them? Get help. But if you take your first job or you're in your first 10 years of your career and you're trying to plan all this stuff um, by yourself, trust me, I was a fool. I spent the first three to five years trying to do this all by myself and trusting my 403B was going to get me to, to the finish line. It doesn't. Find a professional person. But just like patients go and get second opinions from doctors, get second opinions. I interviewed two financial uh, investment, uh, financial advisors, one private, one employed by a bank. I interviewed one investment banker from a big firm downtown in Chicago. He didn't want to give me the time of day. Um, because he's used to bigger wealth. And then I uh, um, uh, interviewed a stockbroker who was all so happy and so excited to see me because he was going to invest my money in high-risk stocks. And the more money that maybe I made, the more money he was going to make. But if I lost money, he was going to shrug his shoulders. I said, well, I can't go to the stockbroker this young. I, I mean, I'm going to, that's not going to, that's not so great. So I chose the private investment banker. I've been with him for 25 years and um, he helped me do something that I would strongly recommend for every young surgeon in this room. You need to calculate the amount of money you need to, you need to save so that you can live the retirement that you wish to live. And, and it's not as hard as you think. We have risk calculators that can tell you what the chances of liver failure are if you operate on a child's A, B, or C cirrhotic, right? We have NISQIP calculators and American College of Surgeons calculators that can tell you what the morbidity and mortality is going to be on an 85-year-old patient you're doing a Whipple on. Well, guess what? That with this actuarial data and with these advanced computer programs, I told my financial advisor, I'd like to be done at 65 or at least be ready to be done at 65. I don't want to be that guy that has to work past that age because I'm not ready yet. And I'd like to live pretty much the same lifestyle we have now. So I remember it was a Saturday. We spent time with uh, um, uh, 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 a Saturday morning. My wife had her computer. I had my laptop. The financial advisor was there. We had a big pot of coffee. And we calculated out based on what I wanted to do in retirement, where my wife wanted to do, travel, maybe have a second home in Florida, living in Chicago for you know 60 some years. And, and we've, we made it realistic. And we built in a little cushion. We underestimated. Um, we, we, we probably do a little bit more things than we want to, but but for the for the sake of calculation, we wanted to live the same lifestyle and be comfortable. And once you have that money, once you have that number, then you can decide your investment strategies. And you remember, you're starting ten years later than the lawyers and the bankers and the the, the engineers. You're starting ten years later, so so you have to be flexible. You have to accept the fact that while you're young. 
um, you should not be uh, paying high mortgages and not leaving yourself any money to invest in. Look at what's happened to the housing market, right? If you if you were ready to retire right now and you had bought some big multi-million dollar home when you were in your 40s or 50s and you had to sell that home now to pay for your retirement, good luck. You take a whooping in the market. Um, and and you, you, you want to be able to look at everything as you go through each decade. You got thir three years, thir three decades, 30 years. You want to know what that number is supposed to be at the end of 10, 20, and 30 years. It's not that hard. The mathematics, the technology is amazing. I can sit down on my phone right now and, and go to a, an app that my financial advisor sent me and click on the button and it'll show you your net net worth. And it'll show me what my taxes are going to be next year. It'll tell me what my IRAs are doing, what my annuities are doing, and um, uh, what, what some of the, the fungible cash is on hand. Um, and I'm at my number. And so now uh, I, got my, I got to my number a few years ago, actually. So now you know why I keep going to these meetings, why I do surgery? For the love of the game. Isn't that the best way? You look around at the senior surgeons in this room, they're playing for the love of the game instead of because they have to or they need to. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that person. So I will conclude my comments by saying, I, I think uh, when I look out at this audience, I can't tell you how high a regard I have and how, how much respect I have for who you are and what you do. And as a senior surgeon, you deserve to retire uh, with respect and dignity and gracefully and on your terms. You don't need to be shuttled out the door and you shouldn't have to be anxious about whether or not you're going to have a great retirement. Um, you deserve that. And for the younger surgeons, if you don't pay attention to this now, what's going to happen to you is down the road in your career, you're going to panic. And this is going to be consuming to you. And instead of enjoying the journey of all the awesome things you do, liver transplants, whipples with vessel resections. I mean, it's incredible. You sit in this meeting, you look at what people do with their lives and how, how typically awesome it is. You should enjoy that ride. You should enjoy that journey. So get this taken care of early. Make it semi-automatic. Find somebody you can trust to advise you and enjoy the ride. And when it comes time to retire, exit gracefully, right? John Elway, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And I, I just want to echo the recommendation to get a financial advisor. And, and that changes everything about portfolio and about your taxes. Uh, the next speaker is Rachel Ashburn, uh, needs no introduction, uh, Chief of Hepatobiliary and Pancreatic Surgery here at the Miami Cancer Institute. And uh, Rachel is going to talk to us about something really important, ensuring and restoring your personal health from medical disability, because we will get sick, we all get sick. And when we get sick, what do we do? Rachel? Thank you. I want to echo what the other speaker said that I'm very appreciative of you inviting me to these old guys lectures. Um, I don't think I'll have a lot of advice like the two prior speakers because it's difficult to have advice. But as I was talking to Scott when he invited me about this and a little earlier today, the only thing I can tell you is about my experience on what I went through. And hopefully within that, there could be something that you can take away. Uh, these are my disclosures. There's no conflicts for this presentation, but there are disclaimers. This is not easy to talk about. And many times we sit in conferences and we play where the macho surgeon, but then we realized that we're just like every one of our patients. It's very personal and may not apply to you. What is the best way of ensuring and recovering for health, for a health event? Prevention. And when I talk prevention, obviously we all know, you know, health, maintenance, exercise, diet, blah, blah, we all know it. But there's something that you cannot cheat and that's your genes. What you can do though, it's developed things that you don't realize are going to be so needed at the time that you are facing one of these events. And it is develop strong support group. And that's within your own family, within your own friends, within your own colleagues. Because by the time this happens, you really are exposed. 
and I use that word very clearly, you are nude, exposed, and whoever is going to be around you, if you didn't develop those bonds, they're not going to help you. If you do, they will help you in ways that you can never imagine you will need it, as you can, as I'm, hopefully I'm going to be able to show you. It is a balancing act, though, when we talk about be prepared and prevention, especially in what we do, because all of this that we talk about work-life balance, it really is difficult to accomplish. And despite that we talk over and over and over about this, and we try to be experts on this, there's a lot that we have to improve. And I think this is an area that hopefully the new generations are going to be able to change because we were trained as you have to do what it's needed. The need of the patient comes first, and I'm still a strong believer of that. But there's a point that the needs are harmful to you, and you need to know when to balance. I personally still don't know about that, but it is something that we'll have to discuss in for future generations. And we talk about finances, and of course, you have to have an insurance a disability insurance, um, even if you're not going to use it. I paid for one very expensive every month for uh, now almost 30 years. And thank God I haven't used it. And I hope I don't need to. Let me talk to you about my experience, though. And it's interesting because it could happen when you think you are the top of the game. And that's how I felt. I had been at Mayo Clinic for 10 years. I'd been chairman of surgery. They had renewed my chairmanship. And all of a sudden, I had several offers. And I decided to take a change and go away from Mayo Clinic to a new institution by Mike Zinner, which I thought it was going to be very, very exciting. I thought that uh, um, I could do something different. And um, even though I was doing extremely well and very grateful to Mayo Clinic, where I had done great cases, my skills had really increased tremendously, and I had a superb OR team to the point that by the time I left, there was party after party, everybody appreciating and telling me how good I was. It was interesting that there was even a 45-minute slideshow about how um, I had influenced people at Mayo Clinic from nurses to, to other physicians, etc. And I say that because at that time, you feel very proud, very accomplished. And so much so that when I was going home, I told my wife in the car, it's so interesting because if I would have died before this, I would have never realized that I made such a difference. Little did I know that two weeks later, that became very close. I arrived on Miami to Miami, and I like to exercise. I had exercised all my life, and I kept myself in what I thought was good, good shape, and I thought, considered that I was in very good health. And because I like to exercise, I wanted to um, basically learn very quickly when I had time off, because of the week of July 4, um, that about different classes in a new gym. And I took three exercise classes, very intense, uh, within a period of 16 hours. This was the last one. This is called aerial yoga. And I felt so proud because everybody else was half my age. And the teacher came and asked me, how long I've been doing this, and it was just my second class. I went out again, typical surgeon's personality, to boast to my wife. I was in a room with a lot of little kids, half my age, and look at this, how good I am, and I look pretty good. You know, in fact, she came at the end of the class, and she took these pictures for me. And uh, this is how you feel, but that same night, even though I had felt very well, I felt a little dizzy. I didn't know what was happening. It was July 4th. We were supposed to go to see fireworks. And I told to her, you know, I don't know what's going on. And she tells me, well, it's going to be your first week at work. Maybe you're a little nervous. I said, nervous? Why? At this stage? Well, you make a big decision. Maybe we decided to stay at home. I, she says, well, I'm going to go and get some food. What do you want to eat? I said, well, we're in Miami. Bring Cuban food. Then we ate a lot of fat, a lot of fried stuff. And uh, the next day I woke up. I went to work. This was my first day at work after I, it took me over a year and two months to decide to move. And on that day, I started to be dizzy again. I realized that going upstairs and the dizziness worsened. I tested myself going upstairs and down the stairs faster. 
and I felt dizzier. I said, is this cardiac? I called my cardiologist at Mayo Clinic, who had been my cardiologist for a long time because I had a, a family history and I had some coronary calcifications. And he had done, before I moved, and this was purposefully, he had done a full workup, including a stress echocardiogram. And for those that are familiarized, I had reached to a METS of 15, which is supposed to be a level of exercise that was extremely good. And he told me, this is six weeks before, that I did not have to worry at all, but because of my family history, even though my cholesterol was low, I mean, it was not low, but was within normal limits, that I should take a study and we did a plan and he said, you're gonna, you're gonna do well. And I asked him how reassurance was, how reassured, how reassured I was by, by his workup. And he said, are you sure that everything was fine? He goes on and on telling me the same thing. And at the end of the conversation, he tells me about, why are you asking me? I mean, we went through this in detail. And I said, well, I had some symptoms that I thought that were cardiac, but must not have been, but thank you very much. I was going to hang up the phone and this gentleman, and that's why I put the picture here. He says, no, 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 hold on a second. This changes things because you're a surgeon. You probably are minimizing the symptoms. I said, no, I don't have chest pain. You need to have a coronary arteriogram today. I said, this is my first week at work. This is my first day. I'm not having a coronary arteriogram today. And he says, I'm not hanging the phone until you promise me you will. I have the phone. What am I going to do? Go to the ER on the first day at work and have people know me? Because this is the guy that we waited for a year and a half, the famous surgeon. And now he's, he's coming to the emergency room. He's, he's a histrionic guy. What is going on? Finally decided that I had friends, and again, we go back to the support group you, you, and the bonds you create before of this, Raul Rosenthal at Cleveland Clinic, who had been chief of staff, and his neighbor, it's, in, it's close by here, I gave him a call, and he was just a gem. He was incredible. He arranged everything. He waited for me in the emergency room, and... Uh, he had the cardiology, the best cardiology at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. They do EKG, enzymes, everything is normal. And so, great, I'm going home. The cardiologist says, let's just observe you overnight, get enzymes in the morning. I mean, let's just see. Next morning, feel very good. And enzymes normal still. And the cardiologist tells me, listen, let's just get the coronary arteriogram. I said, but, but it's no need. You told me that I had basically ruled it out by the exercise I did less than 48 hours ago. So let's just do it because your cardiologist at Mayo is going to be comfortable and you do have coronary calcifications. So let's just do it. He does it and he was supposed to be 45 minute procedure. When I wake up in the recovery room, my wife is there with a face that I had never experienced and he is there and he tells me, I ask him, well, how did it go? He says, well, you need five coronary artery bypasses. He said, are you kidding me? You just told me that I was going to be home by two o'clock. He says, well, you're one of those people that probably would be dead do, while they were doing exercise and you haven't had symptoms because you probably had developed little collaterals. That was my coronary arteriogram. I don't know if I can show you where you guys probably know better than me, but Anyway, there was a widow maker that over 98% and he couldn't understand how I didn't have symptoms. And uh, soon enough, the cardiac surgeon comes in and tells me that um, I should sign a consent for an aortic balloon pump um, because he was afraid that when they were going to induce anesthesia, I was going to have a massive heart attack and that I was extremely fortunate that so far I didn't have the heart attack. I signed the consent and then all of a sudden it hits me I just signed a consent for an aortic balloon pump. I mean, this is crazy. I was healthy you know, 24 hours ago. I talked to the cardiologist. I talked to Raul Rosenthal, and they allowed me to leave the hospital with the condition that I was going to have the bypass done within 72 hours and that um, I was going to report to them. I made my calls. I decided to go back to Mayo Clinic because we were we had just arrived to Miami. I didn't even know where the pharmacy was. I still had my home at, at Mayo Clinic. Went back up and um, had surgery. Everybody treated me fantastically. I was extremely happy with it, with the reason that they were treating me fantastically. Um, 
But before deciding to have the surgery, I went back to something that my patients taught me. And that is we should not be afraid of dying because it will happen to all of us. No one of this room is gonna get away from being alive from this life. We're all gonna die. And we should actually embrace it. And I am a believer that we need to put our energy on things that we have control and to be ready when the time comes. And I was on my own thinking about all of this. And I actually considered not having the surgery because I realized that for myself to be in ready meant that I had done enough things that made me love being alive. And yes, I had a lot of projects. I still wanted to do a lot of things. But as I tell my patients, it's okay. It's understandable because if you don't have projects, it means that you're bored with life. We probably are going to die with projects that we won't be able to accomplish. And that means you're still active. You're still curious, as they were say, saying before. I also wanted to know that I made a positive difference in someone's life. And less than two weeks before that was demonstrated on my farewell in Mayo, I said, I'm okay with it. That I made this a little better place. How much of better place? It doesn't matter. How much of a difference you make? It really is on the eye of the beholder. And don't concentrate how big of a guy you are or how important you are. Just concentrate that you did it on the right direction, that you did affect change for the positive. And that someone cares and loves you. My family show me that. A lot of people show me that. Then I had a serious conversations with my family and I said, I've been so active all my life. I don't want to wake up crippled with a possible infarct and live like this. I consider not having the surgery. That was a difficult conversation with them. But certainly my two boys that were taller than me put me in shape in two seconds and told me, you need to be here, you shape up and go to surgery. And that was helpful. In surgery, however, I woke up with tremendous pain and I didn't know what it was until I realized it was neural pain. I woke up with a complete paralysis of my left arm. That was completely unexpected. I'm a surgeon. I do a lot of what I consider complex surgery and I had enjoyed and my self-esteem, my self-value is based a lot on how good I am with my hands, like several of you. And then all of the sudden, this is like two days later or three days later, I'm finally trying to move, lay in my hand and I'm trying to do an extension of my thumb. And this is how, can we put that, the video on? They told me that a click is not working. Can you click on the video? This is just trying to do an extension of the thumb with full concentration When I see this now, I cannot believe it. They were filming this for me to know the progress I was doing. And interestingly enough, I'm just saying that was better, right? That's how I woke up. How did I recover from all of this? The bonds that I created before all of this. It's what you see, what you have seated, this guy that's sitting in the audience that wanted to be a doctor since he was eight years old and he is with my beeper when I was arrested and my glasses. Later on, he graduated from medical school and then he gave me the surprise when he was doing a rotation in HPV that he loves HPV surgery and finished his fellowship at Mayo Clinic long after I was gone on HPV and advanced GI surgery was my guide for the professional part, was the one that put me in shape because even though he was in residency, still finishing his, his, his residency, he made sure that I do not. And he would text me every day from wherever he was at different times of the day, have you trained your knots? Have you done knots? Make your knots because I couldn't do anything with surgery. He even one time text me, I don't read, I don't, cannot see the, 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 the time, but I think it was past midnight or 1130 at night. And I telling him, 
you butthead. I forgot today, but I'm asleep now. I'm in bed. He says, well, I forgive you for now, but tomorrow you have to do it. Certain enough, I started doing knots and knots and knots until being able to get my hand again, any shape that I could do surgery in the future. My other son, Derek, who is a rugby player, he was collegiate All-American and then he played for the U US national team. And then he went to Oxford and did very well. He became the player of the year for an American to be in Oxford. And my wife, who in her desperation ask the doctor if she could donate her veins on their legs to be able to use on my coronaries because she said he is a surgeon i don't want him to get off without his his veins this was the group of people that i had done bond that I created bonds all my life and then these two gentlemen that they were my ceo my cmo that had tried to recruit me for a year and I had worked less than a week, and they stick by me. They said, we're going to hold your job. This relationship is like a marriage. We don't want you just for a year. We want you for many years, and we want you to create an HPB department. And they were fully supportive. Then I continue. If we can do the videos, please. I continue the recovery for a significant time. That was not easy uh, to do things like this and ask the physical therapist to be patient with me. I, I, I couldn't even move with one hand the coins out of my hand. And this was extremely frustrating. You can start with the other video. When I tried to do simple tasks, like, like putting these teeth into the, into the holes, I had trembling and I couldn't understand why the trembling was. All of this was extremely frustrating for a long period of time. Next. Then the problem was how do I get the confidence to start doing surgery? What am I gonna do to avoid putting a patient at harm? I was very, very fortunate that I had a team of fellows and people that I had trained that offered me help. This is, was a surgeon from Spain that I, turned, that I taught her how to do laparoscopic whipples. And she said, hey, I'm gonna do a seminar. We're gonna do a lap whipple live. You come in and do your lap whipple live with me. And I'm there, you taught me. If there are any problems, I'll take over. That was a tremendous reassurance. That was out of pressure. I didn't have to be with anybody that I could not feel comfortable with. And I flew over there. Interestingly enough, I was very hesitant for the first day of surgery because I was going to do a laparoscopic whipple. That was going to be my first case. And uh, I decided, well, it's okay. She's going to be able to be there for me. As I am going there, I, they tell me that they wanted to do an interview, whatever. And I crossed the hallway the day before the auditorium. And there's another of the professors of surgery doing a distal pancatectomy, and he was in bleeding. After they finished my interview, 20 minutes later, I passed to the auditorium again. The bleeding was still there. My surgeon's training kicked in. I went in. There was a, another of my fellows from Portugal that was attending, and I asked him what was going on. He tells me his trouble, and I look at it, and I know I can help. All my problems went away. I forgot everything, all the fears I had. I asked the organizer, do you think that I can help them? I said, that would be fantastic. I scrub in, not my case, patient bleeding, completely forgot about everything. We were able to do the case. Next day, I felt very comfortable doing my Whipple. It was a gift that was given to me. That was the way to come back. But I do think that one needs to plan how you're going to go back after a big disability. And then a few years, you, you then, you know, are able to recover everything. But even today, when I'm doing a laparoscopic whipple and I'm putting these stitches, for example, on the, on the one millimeter duct, you're gonna see my left hand. I'm doing okay, but I start thinking, is my hand as good as what it was before? My results are the same, everything is good, but you never forget that you recovered from something 
that was very difficult to recover. And what is interesting, the hope that you were going to recover was what carries you through it because you want to go back to feel to be able to do what you did before the surgery. And then it was not only surgery, but I was able to enjoy life with my family, with my friends, and be able to travel again and realize every time that I'm in one of these situations, like the first Christmas, everybody's happy, everybody's talking, and you quietly think, I could have not been here. They would have been thinking, wow, you know, it's sad that dad is not here. But it is a reality of life. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because I wish I could put on you what I learned from my patients, that every day we have is a day to be cherished. And in situations like this, yes, it reminds you of that. Of course, you get into the routine every time. But when my son announces that he's getting engaged, I think the same again. My personal thoughts, be strategic about wellness, but don't obsess. Accept the imbalance and the difficulty of life and focus on what you can control. Try to avoid putting energy on things we cannot control. Cultivate your inner circle. Hopefully I've been able to expose to you how important that has been for me. And don't lose sight of what is important in your life. Right or wrong is relative. Do always the lovable, the lovable thing. I experienced that from the people around me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Horatio, for sharing that very personal experience. As uh, the audience can see, this there's truly a lot of wisdom and experience sitting up here. Um, this committee hopes to share more uh, similar types of things by Zoom, and I hope the um, Junior Surgeons Committee will uh, participate and uh, learn from these valuable lessons. I'm sure there are tons and tons of questions and Maybe if if the participants are okay um, staying, please feel free to go get a drink if you need one. Um, but if there's any questions for any of our speakers on any of the topics, uh, please come forward. Dr. Gazari. Uh, Rasu, thank you so much for sharing this experience with us. I'll tell you, yeah. I'll tell you, uh, Three incidents, one of our CV surgeon was in bike in Maui. He flipped over. He got paralyzed from neck down. He was airlifted to Mayu in Minnesota. And within a year, he was back in operating room. He, he would not stop until he was able again to walk. We had to get him a little device to stand up so that he could operate. About a month ago, one of our associates, he, he, he bike all the time, well fit. He had a little pain, and his cardiologist said, you got to evaluate you. I think the SPECT CT scan, it was range of 900 plus for calcium in his coronary. He required seven bypass. End of November, I was in Philippines doing outreach work. Bright early morning, I fell in the shower. I broke my right shoulder and the other side of Pacific. Here you surgeon and losing your right arm. It required 10 screws and a plate. Three weeks later, I was doing robotic liver resection. So I congratulate you for sharing this with us. You are exactly right. We're all human. We can be patient and we can see ourselves in devastating times, but God is good. Do what is right for you and your family and your patient. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Ghazi. Any other questions or, or comments? I, I do have one uh, comment I want to make, and that is uh, because we are surgeons, this is how we make our life, as Horatio emphasized. We are different from other physicians. We can lose our livelihood if we just lose one hand or a couple of fingers. 
were considered completely disabled. There's probably nothing more important for preparing for your future, your livelihood, your retirement, et cetera, if you don't have disability insurance. And I would like to just emphasize that most of us are employed. And so you get a disability policy from your hospital. It isn't worth anything compared to your personal disability policy. And more importantly, when you leave the institution that you're hired by, your Disability policy doesn't follow you. So everybody should have independent, portable, supplemental disability if you want to strive for the things that we talked about here. And, and specific to your specialty. Yeah, if you can get it. I mean, it's difficult, but if you could get single uh, disability, that's for sure is important. Yes, sir. Hi, Steve Brower from New York. First of all, from everybody here, I want to thank panel for an, an extraordinary session. I've had the opportunity to have a number of you as visiting professors, as chair of programs, seeing you on many, many different levels. But um, the college does certain things to remind us of the transitions, but I don't think I've ever been in a kind of informal closed session like this that uh, really speaks to how powerful the message that you all brought. And, and I've been around enough to have been in some watershed moments at our society lectures, not the least of which is Dr. Pitt giving a lecture or Yuman or, 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 or others. I remember at the SSO when someone told us, you know, managed care is coming and we all said, what are you talking about? Um, but I think this is really rises to that level of just an extraordinary opportunity in a smaller forum to be able to interact like this. And I commend all of you and AHPBA for, for bringing this forward. So thank you very much and good luck in the future as well. Thank you. Hopefully our plan is, to, as I said, to host some Zoom meetings where we can have open dialogue and we can take uh, other topics like this on, and I think that it would be a uh, great value. So thank you everybody and enjoy uh, the cocktail hour, which is right outside. <laughs> yes. well done, thank, you. Likewise. thank you for all your great information. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of courage to stay on. You are not easy. Steve, good to see you. Everything good? Good afternoon. It was honest to do it.